I'll tell a little story. I was a first year resident now 15 years ago at Duke. And in our one vacation that we had, my wife and I went scuba diving. And like I said, I was down 30 feet and I thought, how could all this pressure get added to my eye? And I would still be able to perfuse it, not have a bunch of pain and see. And so instead of enjoying a Corona and my one vacation, I became like a dog with a bone with this idea and came to believe that it wasn't the absolute pressure inside the eye that matters. It's the pressure in the eye relative to the CSF pressure. And the best way we can measure that relative pressure is by doing measuring it relative to the atmosphere. So I came back from my residency. I talked to Rand Allingham, one of my professors at Duke. And I said, Hey, Dr. Allingham, I think I figured out what glaucoma is. It's a disease of two pressures, a high intraocular pressure or a low intracranial pressure. He said, I think you're wrong, but go study it. So indeed, I went to the Mayo Clinic because they had a big electronic medical record. I worked with Doug Johnson, one of the great, great people in ophthalmology, glaucoma specialist. And we looked at over 50,000 lumbar punctures, spinal taps that were performed over a 20 year period. And indeed, what we found was that patients that had glaucoma had a low intracranial pressure compared to patients that didn't have glaucoma. And we published that in ophthalmology. Then further we went and we looked at intracranial pressure in patients that had normal tension glaucoma, primary open angle glaucoma, controls, and ocular hypertension. The idea being simply this, if you have a normal eye pressure and a really low CSF pressure, you have a pressure differential across your lamina cribrosa. If you have a high eye pressure and a normal CSF pressure, then that would be primary open angle glaucoma and you'd still have a pressure differential across the nerve. Reverse that and you have a higher intracranial pressure than you have intraocular pressure and that's papilledema. And we see that in pseudo now, what about ocular hypertension? Well, that'd be somebody that has a high eye pressure, but also has a high intracranial pressure. So the ocular hypertensive may be protected by an elevated intracranial pressure and has not developed glaucoma. So here's what we found. Indeed, patients that have glaucoma have a lower CSF pressure. People that have normal tension glaucoma have an even lower CSF pressure. And people that have ocular hypertension have an elevated and potentially protective CSF pressure because they're the ones that haven't developed glaucoma. So I come back from the Mayo Clinic with this data and I am so excited and Dr. Allingham is excited and I'll never forget a phone call I got from Dr. Allingham that said, you know, I was kind of skeptical of this, but then I saw one of my glaucoma patients this week and they had just had a lumbar shunt placed and it low, and that's intended to lower CSF pressure and their glaucoma fell off the table and got way worse. So we come back and we talk to the chairman at Duke, David Epstein. And if you got the privilege to know David Epstein, he was a brilliant mind. He was enthusiastic. And when he got really excited, he'd talk and there'd be a little bit of foam in the corner of his mouth because he was so excited and the questions they just started flying. Like, what happens to IOP with age? And the answer is that IOP goes down as you get older. And so this has been borne out in a number of different studies that intraocular pressure either stays the same or goes down with age. And you would ask yourself the question, why does glaucoma go increase in incidence as we get older if IOP stays the same or if IOP starts to go down. So that leads to the next question. What happens to intracranial pressure with age? Now, we wouldn't expect glaucoma specialists to know this, so we did a study on it. And this curve makes up 14,000 data points, 14,000 lumbar punctures from the Mayo Clinic. And if you look right at age 65, what happens to CSF pressure? It starts to go down rather precipitously. So what is that? So if we turned this curve upside down and said, oh, Oh, look, it looks like IOP is going up. As you get older, we would say, of course, that's why older people get glaucoma, but that doesn't happen. In fact, what happens is the opposite. CSF pressure goes down. And so as CSF pressure goes down, the pressure differential across the optic nerve goes up. And this is one of the reasons why I think glaucoma is more common in older people is because CSF pressure goes down. Well, that's what our study showed. What did the other study shows? And that similar. 
intracranial pressure seems to go down with age across all ages. Very similar to what we saw in our study. But take a look at this histologic image of the back of the eye. You know, you got the retina, you got the lamina cribrosa, you got the optic nerve, you got this intraocular space right here, and you've got the intracranial space in that light green. And just look at this image for a second. We spend all of our time talking about intraocular pressure when more of the optic nerve is bathed by intracranial pressure than intraocular pressure. And it's only 500 microns or so from the surface of the optic nerve to the intracranial pressure. So five or six pieces of paper thick. That intracranial pressure has to affect the optic nerve. And indeed we know it does because in in diseases of elevated intracranial pressure, that lamina cribrosa and that optic nerve head bows forward. And in case of elevated intraocular pressure, it bows backwards like glaucoma. So the normal is a situation where intraocular pressure is a little bit higher than intracranial pressure. Glaucoma, where there's cupping, would be where the intraocular pressure is quite a bit higher than the intracranial pressure, or vice versa, the intracranial pressure is lower than the intraocular pressure. And forgive me, there's a typo on that last one. Papilledema is where the intraocular pressure is lower than intracranial pressure, or how we usually think about it is intracranial pressure is high. So yes, we measure the pressure differential across the cornea, and that's what we're measuring with Goldman applanation. But what it is, it's a surrogate for the intraocular pressure, which is the pressure inside the eye relative to the atmospheric pressure. But we don't really care what the transcorneal pressure difference is. We care about the translaminar pressure difference and the difference between intraocular pressure and intracranial pressure as it crosses the optic nerve. So let's get even more philosophical. What kind of disease is glaucoma? Is it a mechanical disease? Is it a vascular disease? Is it a metabolic disease? Is it what most glaucoma specialists like to say is that it's multifactorial and there's a whole bunch of things that can cause it? That generally doesn't turn out to be the case. It's usually the simplest answer that's true, but it could be. So the mechanical hypothesis is this, that it's the stress that occurs across the ganglion cell as it exits the lamina cribrosa that causes the disease, the stress and strains on the optic nerve. The vascular hypothesis says that it's low blood pressure or low blood perfusion that causes the optic nerve ganglion cells to die. Now, I do think, and there is data out there to support that decreased blood flow can cause damage to retinal ganglion cells. But the other thing that decreased blood flow or more specifically decreased blood pressure causes is a decrease in CSF pressure. So when you see those little old ladies that are getting worse than their glaucoma and their pressure is 15 and their blood pressure is 80 over 40, I bet a donut that those patients have low CSF pressure too. And then there's metabolic. And what does that mean? That really means axonal transport. And that's the theory that I subscribe to most vigorous. Because if you have an elevated intraocular pressure or a low intracranial pressure, you create a pressure differential across the optic nerve head and axonal transport slows or stops at the level of the lamina cribrosa. And this was demonstrated in a classic paper by Doug Anderson and Harry Quigley from 1978. What that study showed was that as they raised IOP in monkeys, axonal transport stopped at the level of the lamina cribrosa. Now they didn't look at CSF pressure, but what they did also show is that if you raise the eye pressure in these monkeys, you would stop axonal transport at the level of the lamina cribrosa. And if you lowered it for four hours, you would have resumption of axonal transport and you couldn't detect that the axonal transport had stopped in the first place. Now think about that for a moment and its implications because perhaps if we could get the eye pressure low enough, long enough and normalize axonal transport and allow it to flow, perhaps we'd be able to prevent ganglion cells from dying because they got the metabolic needs that were necessary necessary and the metabolic toxins were removed. So what are some other things that we do know? We know that lowering intraocular pressure, even in ocular hypertensives, helps. And only, and if you lowered intraocular pressure, about half of the patients go on to develop glaucoma that would have otherwise. So that's our usual take home from the OAT study. If you treat people, you will decrease their risk of developing glaucoma by 50%. That's true. But in a five-year period, period, 
only 10% of people developed glaucoma. 90% of people didn't develop glaucoma. Why not? Well, I would think that it's likely because of ele elevated CSF pressure. So let's talk about it the other direction. In the United States, what percentage of glaucoma is normal tension glaucoma? About 30%, somewhere between 20 and 50%. 40 to 70% is mild to moderate glaucoma. We've got a ton of great answers for that. We've got four different, five different categories of medications. We've got more MIGs than you can shake a stick at. We've got SLT, which is fabulous. We've got lots of good answers for mild to moderate glaucoma. Eight to 10% of people have severe glaucoma. We don't have good answers for that. We don't have good answers for normal tension glaucoma because most drops don't work well in normal tension glaucoma. MIGs doesn't work that well in normal tension glaucoma. SLT doesn't work that well in normal tension glaucoma. The only things that really do are transconjunctival surgeries like Zen tube shunts and trabeculectomies, but those all come with significant morbidity. And so that's the real risk that still exists in glaucoma. Is there other evidence to support this besides what we've done? Well, our original paper has been now cited well over 400 times in the literature. And this is one of the great studies that was done by Bob Weinreb, Yost Jonas, Ning Li Wang, et cetera, where they showed that if you lowered CSF pressure in monkeys, you saw retinal nerve fiber thinning without even changing the eye. And so, and other groups have looked both prospectively and retrospectively at CSF pressure and glaucoma, and they found essentially the same things that we did, and that the translaminar pressure difference goes up. You can see in patients that have normal pressure glaucoma that their optic nerve sheaths have a smaller diameter, which would indicate a lower CSF pressure. Now, there is one paper out there in ophthalmology, but it only had 13 patients in it that showed that their conclusion was that there wasn't a difference in CSF pressure, although there actually was a little bit of a difference in CSF pressure. So how could we use this information about CSF pressure to help our patients? Well, if we could measure it non-invasively, we could use it to set a target eye pressure. If their CSF pressure was nine, and we knew that they could tolerate a pressure differential of four on average, we would set an IOP target of 13. Or this could be an entirely new area to target drugs that could elevate CSF pressure. But I'm not smart enough to think of any of that stuff. So I thought of a pair of goggles that could actually lower, lower the intraocular pressure. So let's go back to this diagram. And we're going to assume that pressure inside the eye is 22 millimeters higher than atmospheric pressure. So they had an IOP of 22 and they have an intracranial pressure of nine. That leads to a translaminar pressure difference of 13 millimeters of mercury. If we put a pair of goggles over the eye and we draw a vacuum of 10 millimeters of mercury in that goggle, what we just did in essence is decrease the amount of atmospheric pressure that is applied to the eye by 10 millimeters of mercury. So there's 10 millimeters of mercury less force placed on the eye. So the pressure inside the eye should go down 10 millimeters of mercury from 22 to 12. Now it turns out that that isn't quite what happens. It probably goes down instead of 10, it probably goes down six because it increases blood flow to the back of the eye and there's a new pressure volume relationship that's established. But regardless, the principle remains the same and that pressure differential across the optic nerve head that was 13 goes down to three millimeters of mercury. And so our idea was to use a pair of goggles to either add pressure to the eye if we want to increase it and treat conditions of elevated CSF pressure or put negative pressure in the goggles and decrease the intraocular pressure to treat glaucoma. And the beauty of it is that it's based on physics and it's titratable. It's not based on the biological responses of the eye as much. And here's one of those papers that we're studying, but this was from an earlier paper that we published where we put the goggles on one eye and compared it to a control eye both of them had a baseline pressure at 16. And you can see in the blue, when we dialed in a 25% pressure reduction, we saw a decrease down to 13 and a half millimeters of mercury. When we dialed in 50% reduction, it went down to 11 and a half. And when we dialed in a 75% reduction, it went all the way down to 10 millimeters of mercury. Now it is difficult to safely and consistently take a pressure from 16 millimeters of mercury down to 10 millimeters of mercury. And the studies that we've done in our pivotal trial are all in addition to the medical that they're already on.